Good day, good morning, and good evening to the offlane, delivering your weekly dose of Dota 2. Whether you're a new player or a seasoned veteran, tune in as we're going into episode 7, the Summer Summary. My name is T Panda, as your host, and my co-host, this co-host, Potom, Potom of the Moon. That's the weird introduction I have not had one before, but yeah, here we are again. That's, that's uh, one way of putting it. <laughs> we've got some <laughs> interesting topics it, for indeed. today. Yeah, we've got some very interesting topics for this week. We filled in last week quite a lot with TI, everything re related to the TI qualifiers. This time we're going to be talking about the state of Dota 2, basically just reflecting on the situation we're at at the moment. The Chinese practice routines, but not also, I mean, not only the China, Chinese practice routines, but also from different regions, different teams, different organizations, how they work on practicing for events and tournaments, etc. The harsh road of esports will be one of our uh, topics later on during this talk show. And also, not last, but the Summer Cup, Rampage Series, and all those small things that are going on at the moment as the TI qualifiers event. Basically, a results in gossip section. The gossip Side. section, yeah. <laughs> we need a gossip section. Before, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like one of these Bolivar magazines, and we just like flashy headlines, clickbait everywhere. Can we do that? Oh, that would, that would be nice. That would really be nice. <laughs> like, as a parody, like, just throw everything in there. <laughs> Did a couple of good posts about that on the internet. Like, yeah. But let's, so. let's dig right in. So, starting off with the state of Dota 2. Um, one very interesting factor to people who are, who are also new to this talk show, we're, we're talking mainly about different sectors of Dota. We're not only talking about the pro scene, but more focused on the lower levels, etc. You can call them tier two or tier three. You can call them the amateurs, the pros, the casual players. We like to dig and into all of this stuff. <laughs> and the line. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a harsh one. That's a cold one. But, but one thing, Dota 2 has been the most watched esports game for the last three months in a row, which is quite, quite, uh, quite a feat could almost say from april may june as we're now already in july csgo and i believe overwatch was also pretty high on the rankings as well same with league yeah, of legends surprisingly gotta say uh i was when i when i saw the list uh i did expect for first kind of like actually taking the crown to be honest i knew that league, uh, league of legends has a little bit or at least in, in terms of shared uh they did lo lo uh, lose a little bit in the esports eyes but there's so much counter striking on i was really nice. expecting them a little bit um, higher up there but hey overwatch with the third slot they don't the cry and they like back king back to mid uh king back to top what, what do you say <laughs> i don't know there's also hearthstone um but out of all the mobas it's it's always been dota 2 it's been league of legends heroes of the storm hasn't quite hit that peak. They have they have it a big a share in the esports. Yeah, it has yeah, a place. They actually, they actually rise through the ranks, but we are mainly focused by data. Um, we had a lot of esports out of uh, that is true. And that is not only due to the DPC season where we had so many tournaments, especially in the last like super major, just one of them. But they, we had so much going on that we we pretty much lost track. We had like what 50, 40, 55 days of constant Dota two about in the yeah. DPC. And right now, um, it, it never stopped from qualifiers or qualifiers over qualifiers to, to qualifiers doing LAN events and everything. And we never had a chance to really catch up. And like, oh, it was some busy weeks, but we are approaching that summer hole and it's going to get a little bit down. But I imagine it will be the same for the other esports titles as well. It will be like there's there is an ESL one event uh, in Cologne starting uh, actually doing qualifiers for CSGO at the moment. But for Dota's part, it's going to be a couple weeks of wait. The Summit, of course, the bigger event before TI, the last one. We always know that, yeah. you know, the Summit is coming up. And after that, it's TI almost right away. There's probably one or two weeks of a wait and also one or two weeks of a wait before we get there. But the BTS Summer Cup is already ongoing. We'll talk about that a bit later during the topics. But the numbers um, about why Dota 2 is being the most watched esports game. There's been a lot of events that have probably affected not only the player base, but the viewer the viewer base. A lot of people are interested in what is the direction of Dota? Where are we going? Are we seeing a landslide of an, of an increase? Are we decreasing in players or in viewers? But 47.9 million hours, of which 25.9 
have been from esports. So if you compare this number to the second in June, which is League of Legends, over 10 million esports hours difference between these two yeah. MOBA games. I can say the, the total amount or the total amount of hours in League of Legends is fa uh, fairly high, almost yeah, well, it's not, pretty almost, dominant. not doubles up, but it is about is it is about forty percent more. But the share or like a lot of these are personal streams. Like if if we would only go by that, we probably would have to put Fortnite or something on the top because there's a lot of streamers there. So uh, most of it is esports, and Dota uh, trumps uh, trumps both the League of Legends and Overwatch. The two are uh, the, the, uh, the other two contenders. Um, the esports share actually is tremendous. So I'm I'm actually quite happy about this because we, we, we had a time where there were barely any tournaments or it was not even worth streaming them. A lot of the a lot of tournaments or especially the small ones which we focus about yeah, were just yeah. left in the dust and not streamed or well, not on Twitch. Uh, but yeah, like that's another thing. Like uh, this is only or uh, for the most part this is only the Twitch numbers. We still have some other tournaments on other platforms. Which is also true for the uh, for the other esports on the list, but the the share still just absolutely makes it for me. There's two other uh, two other games that come close to it, which is well, it is uh, it's Counter Strike Global Offensive coming up mm -hmm. there, and then the top spot also Overwatch. But that is a entirely different business model, so we're not going to get into detail there. So Counter Strike does pretty much the same that Dota does, just focus around the product and. Valve doesn't do that traditional marketing where they go out and like, hey, this is our big tournament, tune all in and. I don't know. We got we got something, uh, something exciting, something, uh, some stunt for PR, or whatnot. No, just oh, say yeah, yeah. this is our product. We do good tournaments. Uh, turn in if you like it. If if not, please come back later and evaluate again. You're definitely nailing the point that Valve really needs to improve their marketing when it comes to people seeing um, Dota and especially the international, which is the I, I believe it was the second highest prize pool in any sports right after i think poker or pool i'm not even entirely sure which one was the the leader i know it's the biggest in esports i'm not Defi sure definitely biggest in esports definitely but, by there, far. Was, but <laughs> there was there was where dota 2 was ranked really really high because of the ti prize pool and so what you're saying is you want immortal 3 we need higher prize pools Oh, definitely. Right? We're, we're missing Animal treasures. <laughs> Maybe. Just get what yeah. Like, like, let me give, spend my money. <laughs> <laughs> give give viewers and give players what they want. But but then again, how do you market a product to someone who is still a bit new to it? Like the TI yeah. last year, the TI this year, we, we still see a decrease in the player base. It, it's slowly going down. Now there's been a lot of events in the last two months, Super Major, ESL Birmingham, Epicenter, MDL Changsha, and there was also Minor, the GESC in Thailand. So a lot of events bringing new people, but how do you get them to stay? How do you get them to start the game? Because Dota is still one of the hardest games out there yeah, in it, entire it video game history. To approach. So there have been multiple suggest uh, suggestions about this topic. So uh, two attempts I'm going to highlight in particular, uh, which one of them was uh, to keep the players right now. We, we are at the retention phase because this game is getting fairly old. Every video game dies slowly. So what they need to do is uh, you can't just throw 50 million budget and marketing and then just hope oh, the player numbers will increase on a seven year old game. Yeah, it needs That's to be not how it works. So, yeah, like uh, unless you're World of Warcraft, that would not, uh, will not work. So. What you need to do is retention. And for that, we have all these sweet events. Remember Dietite, you know? Oh, yeah. Dietite. All those small things. Chinese New Year, uh, the Christmas events every year. Then, uh, yeah, basically, uh, even stuff like New Moon. And like, Underhollow would have been perfect for that. Like, I, I see them moving in this direction again that we see have stuff like Underhollow or uh, oh, yeah, the Haunted yeah. Colosseum. We have that uh, at one of the. Oh, yeah, the nights. Colosseum as well, true. And then, exactly. And, Colosseum completely died. It was a super fun game mode. It was a complete new concept. People loved it. It was buggy as hell, sure, and there was always the cuddle picker in there. But no. you could you could <laughs> still bear it was still bearable. Uh, but we don't see these game modes anymore. And I feel like this is the reason why a lot of players just leave the game or just yeah, I'm only gonna watch Dota from now on instead of actively playing it. And that affects the player numbers and that slowly spirals downhill. Yep, and and it's it's continuously it's it's moving on and on. You know, like they they bring out under Hollow, which kind of has this battle royale kind of idea, since that yeah. seems to be the thing right now. 
all the all these um uh 100 players taking on each other we've seen a lot of these games like h1z1 you see PUBG coming out a lot of bugs and people are very unhappy with the product but still something keeps on going and PUBG has been hitting insanely high numbers in player counts but viewer counts and esports ready are they're they're dangerous topics yeah. Same with Fortnite gonna, as well. Like Fortnite is say, said to be the game of the of the someone could say century. Uh, We've been waiting for that game to come out, and so people are hyping it a lot. But esports ready. Gotta say, there's a lot of money in Fortnite, but that's not the point. I, I I gotta say, looking at Dota again, I think what really hampered the player growth uh, from stuff like Underhold is. Uh, if if you if you're somebody new, you never played Dota, and then your friend comes, hey, there's this cool little game. Uh, we don't have to play like bot matches and whatnot. No, we just go in an other under holo game. We're gonna have some fun. I explain you the basics. It's a super simple game mode, right? Mm-hmm. You just look at some yeah. you look at some effects, you look at some items. You can actively learn heroes in that mode. It's like playing turbo with uh, with, yeah. with people. So I think one of the main problems is this. Uh, uh, both Underhaul or Silt, uh, Siltbreaker, for example, the last oh, one, Siltbreaker, yeah. the, it has that entry cost. You actually have to pay for the Battle Pass. And I've, if I'm a new person, I download Dota 2 on Steam, which might be a first step, even downloading Steam for some people, and then you just go to one and still have to pay 10 bucks. That's, that's a hard sell. That the is. alternative would be you, you can go for League of Legends and on play for free, even though if you don't like the product or whatnot. Yeah, that's the that's the curse sometimes when you see like you have a free to play game and then you have to actually pay for the the content of the game. And sometimes in some cases you're paying for a free to play game so you can actually play the game because it was a good ad when they introduced Turbo. See the kitty cat yeah. is also interested in Turbo, the that word. It it was a see, it works. great ad. Yeah, it was a it was a great <laughs> ad for casual players. People who want to have these short games still have the full enjoyment of the game. Maybe learn a couple new things because things are happening really quickly in very short spurts. You know, so the yeah. the casual players it definitely served their favor, and they were really happy that we have that. And even most of the like experienced players, people who've been around for who knows how many years, ever since Dota One, having this extra game mode has done wonders. But still, like, no PR revolved around this. Like, Valve could have easily thrown out somewhere that we have a new game mode. Come and check it out. If you're a new player, you're probably going to enjoy this. Exactly. And the one thing that came to mind for me is, look at other games. Like, I, I can't really speak about, uh, about League of Legends. I haven't, haven't really had that entry yet. But I look at games like StarCraft, best example. Because StarCraft, it wasn't planned as that multiplayer game. It was a big part of it in StarCraft 2, that is but it has that single player campaign. Um, if you go into Dota, you start playing the game, you have no clue what you're doing. It is multiplayer only, and it's, uh, then you run into toxic walls of players or whatnot, and you might lose interest. StarCraft yeah. does it differently, because you have a full campaign where you lean, learn the absolute basics of the game and some advanced strategies from the very beginning. And then you go into players, and then you uh, or up against players. And I feel like if, if uh, if Dota would integrate something like a Silk Breaker campaign or whatnot as a t- more tutorial base, that might work. But the problem is too little too late. We're seven years in. This game is old. That is true. This game is becoming old. So if you want to bring something out, it has to always be really shocking. Remember when Techies came out, for example? Yeah, great. That was, that, was in the, that was in the TI um, All-Star match when they first introduced the hero. Man. Everyone went crazy about it. Like, wow, we get a new hero. Now we just seem to get these small patches where they introduce a hero. Of course, they're waiting for it, but it just doesn't feel the same anymore because it's yeah. it's old. It, we've seen this happen I before. Mean, like, it does give us a new hero. Someone might be really waiting for it, and they they're already like looking into the like the research into it and just wants to look up every small bit of detail that they can find all the way from searching Dota 2 folders, finding a README file which has a hidden Easter egg somewhere. <laughs> to all of these, like yeah, some but, people are real fanatics after these. Yeah, these are the fanatics. diehard fans. Yeah. But I, I would I would like to point out that we when we had Nureska and Pangalia edit, or Dark Willow and Pangalia, excuse me, uh we actually had a bump in terms of player numbers. Like it, it came with some cosmetics and whatnot and 
that worked. It, it yep. even even such a small thing did, did really pull people back because people were not really passionate for a game that they don't play. They don't care. Like if if you don't play yeah. Dota for a year and then there's oh there's a big new patch, like yeah, I guess they changed some stuff, but the concept remains the same. So if you put new stuff into the game or an event, that actually spikes interest to people. I think this is the direction we have to get moving to. Do you also see this this kind of uh, split between the pro players who are doing this as a job? Of course, they find these like like Under Hollow has been a great addition to most of these uh, more experienced seasoned players because it's refreshing. And you don't need to stress that much about it. You can, of course, you can go full try hard mode and make the best out of it. But when it comes to the gap between the pros and the casuals, and especially when you go from casuals to new players, is there like a gap between all of these? And is that something that you also need to take into account when it comes to marketing and PR when you want to recruit new players and keep the old ones to stay? I think we, we see that quite often that you actually have to market it to lots of complete noobs. Like retention is not done via marketing. Like a pro player that has already caught on, on Dota and like, uh, do I want to stop playing or I, I play less and less and less and less over the course of the years and then I see a Dota ad, I'm not going to say, oh, wow, they made an ad. Uh, yeah, I knew this game already. They don't really care. They don't stay before the game because of marketing yeah. budget. So the marketing attracts new players to the game but they need to be able to stay in the game or at least they need to fill up the slowly decaying user base. And that, yeah. the first step would be solid tutorials. Second step, make sure you have a system for them to work on. And if they ever want to go pro, semi-pro or whatnot, or just become a competitive team, then give them the resources to work with them. Exactly. If they, if, if they want to find a team, if they want to find tournaments to compete in, you need to actually, yeah, you need to actually have access to information. But we're gonna come to that topic a little bit later. Because we, we, we planned something out for that. Well, now that we, we've talked through about the, the casuals, the new players, the PR, etc., let's jump into the more pro scene and a very important topic to go through, which is our second topic, the Chinese practice routines. Uh, this shocked us, yeah. I think it was one or two days ago. I think it was yesterday when I saw this the first time. Um, a person called Molly, I think it was God bless Molly on Twitter, Correct, posted yes. about posted about the schedules and rules for one of the Chinese teams that are competing at TI. So these things include practice hours of 11 hours in total, no sponsors, no medias, etc. allowed during the duration of the boot camp until they go to Vancouver for TI, no cell phone allowed during practice hours. And a lot of things regarding into this. So Molly there's brought more. out the point. There's, there's even more. After after you cell phone, uh, no cell phone alive, there's also players aren't allowed to browse any social media during mm -hmm. practice hours. Like practice will happen six days a week. During the day off, they do activities together. So most likely, yeah, just one day off where you still talk a lot about Dota. Um, yeah, basically that that uh, that's the thing that shocked me the most. If the manager, coach, or player is late for practice, they will be fined. The biggest fine is for the manager. So, uh, well, sorry, uh, tr uh, rough, rough transition from, from currencies. So I understand that roughly 13 euros and $15 per minute yeah, after that is five minutes a late. Lot. So if you're stuck anywhere, that's a lot of money you lose. Um, despite we're all joking about how much pro players uh, earn and the coaches and managers, that is still a lot of money. So they gotta make sure I might as well just, might as well just stay there overnight in a practice room anyways. Yeah. And when it comes to other players also notifying and talking about this, it first, when you read this, of course, you feel a bit shocked as well. Like, you're not allowed to use your phone. You're not allowed to look at any social media. And you have to practice so much, like, your, your entire full week. Pro players responded. For example, Matumba Man from uh, Team Liquid says that 11 hours of practice a day is much. And then he says that I don't think any single team that is going to be competing in TI8 will be practicing that minimum with a couple of exceptions. Of course, he did uh, bring out the phone restriction is phone restriction is GG, though. So, of course, that does refer to uh, maybe a bit too harsh. But 11 hours of practice still seems reasonable for me as well, because you're talking big money, lots of viewers, your chance to shine and a once in a, a lifetime experience. 
Exactly. Um, I, I want to go back to the phone really quick. Yeah. Because uh, the phone thing is, is it's kind of normal. Like it, it, we we're a little bit privileged to work in this industry where like yeah, I can always check, I can always check Twitter, I can always go on my phone because we work with it daily. But for a player, if you take it in perspective of a traditional job, how many jobs allow you to like? Yeah, I know everybody probably has an exception and knows how to cheat the rules and real life jobs, but you can probably not get away with checking your phone constantly and whatnot. It is okay to be reachable. I would assume even for uh, even for these kind of rules, mm -hmm. uh, it says no cell phone is allowed in practice. I, just, I don't think that means we're going to lock your cell phones in a box. I think that means, hey, phones lay down here on the table. If there's something really important or something and you need to take a course, yes, then yes, that is still exactly. okay. Like. I, I, I think it's a little bit out of context uh, how it was. How it, it, was it could so definitely be. Me. <laughs> I mean, like, it's, it's completely normal. You see yourself doing your normal day job. Of course, if you're sitting on your phone, it doesn't really give you the best impression, first of all, to your boss, and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So that is totally understandable yeah. that they mention it like that. But, of course, um, there are... Okay, I, I, can't, I can't figure the word for it flexibility so there's there has to be some flexibility between the given guidelines sometimes rules but more like guidelines that you go by these yeah. and you learn the routine easier because we've given you how it is we can make exceptions and of course if you have emergencies it doesn't mean that you know you're not allowed to take your phone that is as you said out of context so all yeah, of these um... things are of course they're personal between the teams the, between the players but Exactly. Yeah, and in a, another to uh, topic, like still going back to the rules, uh, looking a little bit uh, over it, like I, I like the fact that they say no sponsor media led during the duration of the weekend. That means no streaming uh, for the players. That means nobody to bother you. So you're fully focused on Dota. And the, especially the times, where a lot of people were really mad about what from 13 to midnight, that is a lot of hours of Dota, right? Yeah. Like that is 11, 11 hours of Dota a day. But considering this is not just scrim after scrim after scrim after scrim, in 11 hours of Dota and replay analysis, I think you can fit in, what, three, maybe four best of threes? And keep in mind, there's definitely some breaks for, for snacks or drinking or whatnot in between. Yeah. It's not like they, like they, yeah, they, they don't get shackled to, the, uh, to their chair and you have to play uh, uh, yeah, until, until midnight and then, then you can get something to eat or go to the toilet. That's definitely not the case. Exactly. Like you do have basic human rights for everything as well. So it's... Most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. And hopefully it's, that, that will be a bit wrong if you start taking away privileges or start to so-called, um, like start parenting in a more yeah. more harsh i wouldn't say a harsh way but maybe that's not the word i'm looking for you probably know the better is, word for it i think discipline and being more harsh on pro players is really needed because that is what separates a professional from a semi-pro or an amateur because they do this full most of them do it full-time especially in the chinese scene you get paid month per month to play dota if you don't want to do that you're free to do so unless you sign a really bad contract but that is still on you so I think I think it's absolutely fine to be a little more harsh on pro players in this regard, as long as you still nail basics. You can't like as mentioned, you can't say you can't go to the toilet, yada yada. And if the if if the player and the organization still have the common goal of we want to TI, we want to win tournament X, tournament Y, doesn't matter. As long as you still have that goal with all uh, with the organization, with the player, with the manager, I think everybody is fine with with, with these rules and nobody will complain about it. Yeah, like, you could even go further with this. Like, why is you could also like you could almost make this boot camp or I can see boot camps actually becoming a more uh yeah more uh a thing more in the future where you have set up land spots oh, yeah. of, of course scene. of course we see it in this in the sea scene a lot where a lot of land cafes where teams actually only practice in those they didn't uh, practice remotely with each other no they like most constantly just playing together in local scenes and that really develops them further and i think this is the way we need to go if we want to take it uh further on a professional level what do you think about, however, the being late, like after five minutes? We, we've talked about discipline. We talked about how things need to work so that the whole structure goes onward. You need every piece of the cog for the clockwork to work. 
but being fined 13 euros, 15 dollars, 100 RMB per minute after five minutes being late. What do you think about this? If that was the exact rule, I think I think it's a little bit harsh from the get go. Um, con- considering considering you have five minutes to lateness, tight schedule. I th- I still think a little bit out of context. I think if there's a reasonable uh, like if if there's a good reason for it, like hey, if it's out of your control, that stuff happens. Whatever, like but you you missed your bus or whatnot. That's something else. But then oh, the bus actually broke down. Like there's differences there. I think I think it really depends on a case by case basis. And yeah, it is completely taken out of context. Saying like uh, they considered late after five minutes. This is the exact wording. Consider, uh, considered late doesn't mean he's he definitely gets panel, uh, penalized. It's more like a deterrent from people to like, oh yeah, I guess I have to go to team practice at one, uh, 1 p.m. But yeah, I'm I'm gonna go. Let's see if I'm on time. It's basically just an incentive to to be on time and not a big deal. Yeah, obviously players do bring out their own passion, their own drive, and whatever tournament it is, they always want to go for the win. So this does separate us from the teams that really want to win, from the teams that just go into the tournament and try their best because yeah. you can um, the way i'm saying it like trying their best is you're saying it but you're not doing it exactly it, it's a threat it's a it's a friendly threat you could almost say yeah yeah <laughs> i'm not threatening you though <laughs> you're fine yeah i think giving, i think this is not line. only I, I don't even think this is uh, only a uh, chinese scene they take it a little bit to the extreme at times so it looks extreme to us but I think most European teams that are in TI will definitely, they easily practice 11 hours a day. Yeah. Like, we have some streamers casually playing daily on, uh, on a monthly basis uh, over, well over the 11 hour mark. Yeah, you so could almost I, say that 11 hours minimum <laughs> instead yeah, of maximum. Basically. It's like they, they could say, like, uh, uh, like, 13 to midnight at least, and it's open end. Yeah. Of course, it's important to like grab your good night's sleep, keep your temper, keep your mood up. All these small factors with sleep deprivation to all that. Of course, teams, managers, all those people like looking after those players will obviously take part into those. And that's that's when you need to also be pay attention to the rules when there is a time limit that you're going with. If it's 11 hours, how much time do the guys have for the little breaks for eating? The little breaks for just uh, taking a little walk, refresh themselves, but also for sleep, which is very important. And a lot of people forget that you can keep on acting, you can keep on playing, but you in a in the long run, you're gonna notice either burnouts, your your um, mood starts to temp diff, like, you know, you know what I mean when it when it yeah. comes to moody players and all that. It, it all comes from small things that you're not exactly. given. And we we have seen some extreme examples on that on players oh, we that have, they really we have. did get that burn out and have to take a break and whatnot. But I think we're in a good spot. Uh, we we still got to see how the scene develops in China, especially after uh, after yeah, especially after what happened with new valve ruling we talked about last week. I I gotta say, I feel like a lot of teams will shake it up and boot camps will be more uh, will be a way more common practice very soon. Yeah. There was a a person that uh, you asked to take part in this specific conversation, Jack Chen, KBBQ, who is a Dota 2 interpreter and a manager for the North American team, VGJ Storm. You had a little conversation with him, though, because he was not able to join us. Very brief one. We had a very uh, very brief one. I reached out to him and basically asked him about his opinion. He said it is it is uh, that it's pretty uh, like that China in general is pretty rigged. Uh, and it sometimes does burn out the players, but the things are like it, it's always like that for TI. That's just what happens. Um, it's TI. They practice. They have the goal as well. They want to win GI. They want to bring glory back to uh, to the Chinese teams because China, well, has been struggling at least over the last season for quite a while. It is, and they they do always find a way to TI, especially if the oh, teams definitely. Awesome. I'm we gonna can say look at, China yeah. looks more promising to me than some uh, some A teams. Like my guess on is on Vici. I think Vici is gonna have. There's gonna be. Uh, they're gonna be the dark horse where everybody's like, ah, Vici. Yeah, they're gonna lose like group phase. Uh, oh last yeah, yeah. <laughs> Open qualifier team will stomp them or something like that. And 
I really think that VT is going to get the strats out for, uh, for TI, and we have a lot of Chinese teams once more in the upper brackets uh, fighting, fighting against each other. There's also, like, for several TIs in a row, definitely Chinese teams perform. That's what Jack Chen also said. I totally agree with this. Newbie from TI4, one big surprise. In TI5, I believe, C-Deck came out of nowhere, considered the dark horse that they're just some players. Uh, was it was it C deck? Uh, first of it, all, it was CD, it was C deck. CDEC. CDEC. CDEC exactly. Yeah, they hate it when you call them C deck. Oh yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll they'll take the blame for that. So CDEC. Yeah, C P under. <laughs> CDEC no, and then scroll. <laughs> then the next year Wings Gaming, and Wings also came out of nowhere. They, I uh, Wings was an organization, right? Or were they um, an unsigned team? I mean, I believe it was the organization behind it. I don't know the entire history of Wings here, but I I know that Wings was the big surprise for everybody. And I gotta I gotta say, it's especially like it's it's people forget what happened even on the last TI. Like look at uh look at look at TI uh, in 2013. Look uh, at 17. Look at the last year where people like ooh China not gonna do anything and done. Yes, you have Liquid taking the crown. Everybody is happy with that. But who comes after that? Tell me. Who comes after Team Liquid? Second slot, Newbie. Third one, LGD. Uh, LFY. Fourth slot, LGD. So that's three Chinese teams in the top four straight from the get-go. And then you have Invictus Gaming on the fifth to sixth slot tying up with Virtus Pro. So that is four Chinese teams in the top six of TI. And then people tell us, oh, China's not going to have a chance? Nope, I don't think so. I think China is a hot contender to actually win this, uh, win the next TI. Yeah. Because slowly they have been adapting. Like, we, we always criticize that, oh, Chinese Dota, they have a BKB timing, and then at one point they push, but they can't close that games fast. They, they are not familiar with pushing strats. And then you have uh, heroes like uh, Super, XXS on Lina, Leshrac, the entire time where they just push all over the place, and they just... They're just always up in the face of their enemies and just end, min uh, end minute 25 to 26 when they have the first uh, uh, objective on lockdown and then just run down a lane and end the game. Chinese teams are always surprising to, to most of the people, but that's, that's just for the plain viewer base. Most of the people see that China always seems to, I would almost say, outperform most of the regions. In some of the majors, we see a lot of differential between which team is going to be winning which event. And if you take a look at uh, the DPC from this year, that's pre-TI, we had a lot of different winners from every event. So that also tells about the differential between the Chinese scene, the European scene. South America, which has been a, like creating an uproar, Pain Gaming, for example, okay. getting getting to <laughs> second place in one of their events. Also, Infamous taking a semifinal. Um, I believe that was one of, one of the minor events where they got knocked in the semifinals. So that was not a fourth fourth place. That's the semifinal. This, uh, I mean, uh, knockout. And a lot yeah, of interesting it's... teams that have been taking part. Like the one thing, uh, what I am a bit, uh, I wouldn't say worried. But looking forward to a bit, but also scared a bit, the CIS teams. Fly to Moon came out of nowhere. They did a great job in Epicenter. Everyone was blown out of their minds that this team that wasn't even signed by an organization is dropping all these huge teams behind. I was like, wow, where is this coming from? But is it only going to be Fly to Moon? Now that Espada also got knocked out 3-1 in the CIS qualifiers, yeah. How, how do you think? How are they going to do in TI? I think the CIS teams, they, they're not quite there yet. But Virtus Pro aside, Virtus Pro is a little bit of a different tier in the CIS region alone. I think uh, overstating Virtus Pro in general terms, like saying, oh, they're going to play through all the opponents, that is a little bit too, that's a little bit too, too, too optimistic, you could say. I think Virtus Pro is definitely in the top three contenders, uh, VP, Liquid, LGD, these three. Uh, maybe VG as an upcoming star. Yeah. But uh, to go back to your question with, uh, with the CIS teams, I feel like Windstrike, not quite there yet. I, I would consider it on the same level as like a Pain Gaming or a, uh, or a TNC Predator team, where they have really good phases, but I don't think they can keep up with the pace of pro uh, professional teams 
swiping, like putting in putting in these hours in practice, especially uh, to a similar effect, I would uh, cons consider Team Serenity up in there as well, but they have the benefit, they have an organization behind them, yep. uh, or they, they have a solid structure behind them that is, um, they did surprise everyone, and they, they already have well-known players that, yeah, I used to, uh, I used to this pace. So I would say, yes, CIS region has a chance, mainly with this pro, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I doubt we're gonna see a win uh, a win strike team uh, go go up into like upper bracket or whatnot. I I think they're gonna make make a make a sort of fifth sixth place in uh, in in the groups. Take take a game off one of the uh, big contenders, and at the bottom, oh, it's it's actually more exciting to see who actually drops that in the first phase. Looking at uh, looking at the qualifier teams or in everybody on the list that is. Well, we're getting really hyped about TI already. I'm getting goosebumps already because I'm like, <laughs> even if there's still the summit coming up, I'm just thrilled and waiting for TI so badly. So let's talk about our third topic for today, which is the harsh road of esports. And this is a good reflection point when it comes to TI as uh, casting the talent that we've had before what we've had in the in the past few years a lot of casters have changed a lot of panelists have changed it seems like at the moment we are less than we were before but i, I could be completely necessarily wrong. agree there i i don't think it changed that much in terms of talent that is uh we, we've seen from the caster so obviously we're gotta say me and panda we're both a little bit biased on uh, on this topic so well both not, bit, bit. <laughs> not not we're not that well known for major terms that's stated that way oh we'll, uh, we'll, we will be <laughs> <laughs> that's optimistic hey hit me up <laughs> hey i mean you uh, gotta you gotta aim high oh uh, yeah but i i think the main focus uh about this is uh like you talked about talent changing and whatnot i think we've seen this particularly trend about managers and coaches so Managers and coaches were almost an unheard thing of an oh, only the Chinese teams they have they have a coach. We, we don't need that. We we just play Dota. Um we've seen we have seen that shift away to like, oh god, we don't have a coach, what do we do? <laughs> and now you see every upcoming pop star team with five people, they always have a coach. And it's always one of the one of the uh, one of the pro players uh breaking uh that did break out from the scene, uh that actually managed them, or talking about coaches managers. There's so many different kinds of coaches and managers. Like there, there could be motivational coaches or big strategy coaches. Uh, uh, if it comes to really good strategy and team management, uh, as well as like uh, team attitude, I would put Kips uh, in there or Kips all that is um, yep. recently managing for Vega. And if it comes to the more manager aspect, as well as the pure uh, analytical approach, uh, what would come? It would be Alan Cook, bonkers. That is uh, the manager for Team Blinkpool. So. Oh yeah, Bonkers, yeah, the yeah. guy who was with Mad Lads before, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, he, he's up there as well. I think he, uh, he's one of the best examples where we have a coach that is not only analytical, but also fills in this manager role. And I think this is really important that the players, if, if you have 12 hours of Dota a day, you want to focus on 12 hours and not on 9 hours, plus 1 hour for finding a scrim, 2 hours for networking, whatnot. No, you want a manager to do that. Perfect. Um, I, I think we're at a point where managers and coaches get more and more on stage. We also saw other uh, other esports following through. Like, look at Overwatch. They they even have like reserve players they bring in from the bench uh, mid match, which is really yeah. cool if you ask me. <laughs> it, it it is. It's it's <laughs> almost like comparing to an NHL team who doesn't have a third goalkeeper. So they ask the person who is like uh like not a therapist, but no, you know, the guy who gives gives all the. Do you, do you, I don't even know the word for it. I'm a bit lost with this. I know the Finnish word for it, obviously, but well, what is the Finnish word? Care, caretaker. Will that will that suffice? Like you just caretaker call in this terms guy. of yeah. well, what does he do? I'm, I'm I'm a little bit lost because you're going with real sports and uh, anal analogies here. Okay, well, so. <laughs> the, the the background makers, the silent people working at behind behind the team, giving all the. All the, the manager, equipment, the, the equipment. No, I mean like the, the equipment, etc. If someone gets injured, the people who come and take them and guide them into the locker rooms and all that stuff. Yeah, calling, call, but, but basically, 
But going back into the main point, calling in those people for a one-day like uh, signed contract that we need a goalkeeper. He's probably never even done it before. They put him in goal, and the whole crowd roars. Like, if especially if it's a home crowd, like wow, like we won a game with a goalkeeper who's never even been goalie before. So if that's same, you going comes, far with this analogy. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the same same kind of situation when you bring out these players like from stand and slots to play in in the actual roster for tournaments we've seen uh, from OG for example Seb who uh, was a stand in for quite a long time and he I was think, a coach for the team yeah but i think the main problem with that is that you can't really build up a player as uh, your reserve slot you always go to first of all that you is have five that positions is you need to fill at best, you have a player that plays on the same level for position 5 four, 3 maybe. Yeah. Or the mid-player can usually play carry as well on, uh, on a reasonable basis. But you most end up uh, with at least three standards you need to go for. And they're not always available. So you can double it up to six with two backup slots. I Meaning you have six people now. And then these people need to be, if you're on a professional team, they need to be in the payroll. Good luck punching that through with any <laughs> esports team. <laughs> hey, I know you want to hire a Dota team of five players. And we also need a manager. All right, that's fine. Oh, we also need six backup players. Can we just hire them? And like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, in that case, you could just here. you could just build a secondary roster inside the same organization or that in exactly that case, because and you we need talked to train about this. Yeah, we did. We, we talk talked about this, about this uh, with with the runner runner up teams and especially how uh, or the B teams that is and especially how Valve is doing it with you can only have one team representing TI. I think what we're going to see on a bigger basis next year is that you actively can swap and build up players in your A and B team together because there is that new DPC system and you still get some points. Yes, there's penalties and there should be, but you actually can get a team or a team name to TI and then build around that team instead of just saying, hey, uh, yeah, we have five players here and they're under this name now and then the organization kicked them and then they go for another name. That's no longer the case. So we might end up having more stability for the teams that they stay longer with organizations, similar to like, hey, uh, Bulldog with Alliance or uh, Dendy with Navi. So that kind of stuff might be, might be more upcoming or once again upcoming where, te where teams and sponsors and everything just build their brand and have solid dirty teams and they give really good conditions to, yep. uh, to play. And I think this is something we need to not only in a T1 scene, but the, the current T1 scene needs to evolve to what I just described, and the current T2 scene needs to get lifted up to the tier 1 status, basically. So we basically tier 0, uh, you could say. We, we, we uplift the... We, we basically pull everything one step up on tier 1, 2, and 3. When it comes to setting up players and managers and all these, let's talk a bit about talent. And what, what are, um, like... Okay, I might, I might be doing a little, little, oh, well, I am certainly struggling with my, my English at the moment, but <laughs> starting a career as a talent, which is a whole different thing compared to players who usually find it through a, an, an interest with the game itself and realizing at some point, like, hey, I can actually pull myself off in this thing. As a talent, how do you start your career? Well... The first, or, or the first answer you will get from anyone in the sea is just cast it. You exactly. Go, yeah. go, go on Twitch, it. download OBS right now, take any game whatsoever, go stream, practice. That's what 95% of the people will tell you. If you're really smart, however, I think it doesn't cut it anymore. You don't go out there and say like, hey, uh, like, let's apply to like Twitch streaming. You don't go out there and say like, yeah, I'm just going to stream. No, you actually have to have a plan escape because the, the deck is stacked. We have so many people in streaming, for example. The market is filled, you could say. Like, if yeah. your first intention is to, I want to cast because it's fun, that's great. That's really good. We need that more. But if your second intention is, I eventually want to move forward, I don't want to make this like a slow, I don't, I don't want to be like a snail slowly, like maybe getting fans. Like, if you really want to take this into consideration going forward, then you need an actual plan. And that is meaning you need to work, you need to figure out how do I do production, for example. Can the most people do it straight off the bat? I doubt it. It's really hard. I mean, that's why I co cast. You gotta, don't gotta deal with this shit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But yeah, like that's. I don't know what to feel right now. <laughs> the second thing is knowledge. You need to know every player on every team what they did in the last fifteen years. You need to know all the references, and this information is really hard to come by. I tell you, like research is probably sixty percent of the job, especially for co-casters. That is, with a little bit less focus for the play-by-play. Ah, uh, for the people not knowing, a play-by-play caster is someone like Toby One that scream or T Panda uh, that screams at the action. Uh, while not really knowing what they're talking about, but they do it pretty good. Analyst, curse, that's more like them, that's more my part. So we have an, uh, at least a somewhat knowledge of the game, we give some flavor in it, and we point out the important things. Which I gotta say, play by play is probably still a little bit harder because you, you actually, yeah, you, you can't choke that easily. I like that's the part really where you trait. called me out right after Toby won. I feel so, I felt special <laughs> for a bit right there. But but yeah, they, but yeah you gotta, you gotta put like, in people from the top and the bottom spectrum. You know, I had to balance yeah. it out. <laughs> and that is also an interesting factor. You're talking about: uh, Are you a co-caster? Are you an actual caster? Where are your strengths? You just need to like yeah. you need to what find them out by yourself. Like, what are you? What are you? What is your what thing? You, what freak? is what is <laughs> your your forte, so to say? So, if if we could we actually hear a bit more about your background? Can you like you're a co-caster? And I'm a play-by-play uh, -play caster, so we have two different stories. But well, we want to hear the, yours. The background story uh, for me is not that interesting. I think more, a more general approach uh, is better because we are at a crossroads in the casting scene. This is really, this is really uh, niche, you could say. Where I see in the next two years, uh, aside from the established people you always see in these big tournaments already, ninety percent of the new people or co-casters will be pro players that either retired are still actively playing Dota, where they do this on the side. While I think that is a good, really good thing knowledge-wise, uh, it is also, it, it's quite frightening. It because is, it is. Considering that our player base is dropping, we're not only talking about, at one point we will have like, what? Like, some people that play, but a lot more people that cast, that doesn't really mix up well. So, we, we're shifting the spectrum by quite a mile, and I gotta say, it is, it is weird. Because there's so many people, and um, if basically you can say it, if with if you have one if you have one loaf of bread, uh, that might be enough for four people. But if you suddenly have like fifty people, then nobody like everybody goes so hungry. You know, like it, it's not uh, hungry in terms of like everybody casts one game instead of like somebody casts a normal amount. So I think uh, I think it's going to move forward towards the pro players. And one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of this is that Valve is not really actively doing something against this. There's less and less money in esports scene. We talked about this uh, in yeah. early episodes. Can check them out on the Twitch channel. Uh, should be there, also on the YouTube one. Uh, but uh, one of the big issues is Valve is not building an infrastructure to help people. One of the biggest things I mentioned before is research. We have amazing tools. I gotta give a shout out to Liquipedia and Open Dota here because they really save my ass a lot of times. Yes. Um, it, but just imagine a couple of years ago, we didn't have that. Good luck finding any info on a smaller tournament. The big ones, yeah, yeah. still got covered. Half these up, but hey, find somebody about a BTS Summer Cup. Good luck. If you did not watch it live and take notes, you're tough out of luck. It's Unless kind of like a, up. it's kind of like a luxury that we have that we have all these databases at our disposal. We even have like a lot of articles about the players, about the teams, about everything that's evolving around the pro scene and also like tier two tier three you can even find a player that's been around for quite some time but you've never run into it like personal you've never seen this player's name before like should i know this guy you can check it up and you probably will find it but you go backwards two two years three years anything plus four years when it was a lot harder to find absolutely anything and you had to do a lot of research to keep yourself up to date, but also need to know the sources where you can find this information. Where can you share it, probably, even forward to other people? Yeah, and we're even more privileged because we're English talent. We speak English. Look at yeah. all the scene in the Chinese era, which is huge. And I'm not sure if there's like a uh, Chinese equivalent to like uh, Liquipedia or whatnot. Uh, somebody can point out to me later. But... I gotta say, it must be really hard and frustrating if you're a non-English uh, speaking talent, or at least only mediocre English, and that's all, all fine by me. 
but you try to find information, it might not be available in your language, it might not be available uh, on one of your groups. You might not even know about that such a source exists, even with a different language, yeah. because it's not public or it's not really public information. It's like, yeah, by the way, this happened this week, and you never come across it. Like, let, let's let's even even to the basics. If we go to uh, go towards players, players finding a scrim. Yes, there's some Discord groups. What do you do if somebody never used Discord? You might not even get to get to talk to a person that knows about the group uh, that organizes scrims and whatnot. Yes, there's a, for example, there's a there's an entire subreddit just dedicated to finding scrims and players for your team. Yeah. That is great for amateur players. But why are these not promoted? Like, why are these not interlinked? One thing I, uh, I saw a lot on Reddit is calling back for the community and, uh, and guilds function in the client, in the Dota client, that is, because that has been kind of completely ignored. Um, I got to say, that was a great way to spread the word uh, of stuff happening. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, talking so about upcoming stuff, we do have another topic. Would you like to introduce this? Well, we are going into the last section, which is the Summer Cup and the Rampage series. BTS Summer Cup, which is uh, ongoing at the moment. So I've seen some very good teams playing in this tournament. There's such as like teams that uh, I, I believe some of them haven't even been to the TI regional qualifiers. There's teams that I've dropped uh, out in the open qualifiers, yeah. like No Bounty Hunter, for example. Megalata? Uh, no, no, yeah, I was about to say Megalata. That wasn't entirely sure. Did they actually get there? Um, very good teams as well who were like straight to the phase two. As there are, there's a phase one, there's a phase two. So two different invites. So phase, phase one three. has to clear. Yep, yeah, and a phase three. So they first have to clear their way out for the phase one, which has uh, almost been completed. There's still one more game, and that is actually live at the moment. But do you want to take us through some results regarding the BTS Summer Cup? I will do because uh, I will it's... allow your. This is yours. <laughs> All right, so we uh, we had the following participating, uh, participating teams for the uh, Phase 1 invites. That is Team Empire, No Bounty Hunter, Megalodon Esports, 20 minute AFK or less. That's the Flow and Seneca stack uh, with Arc attached. Uh, Vega Squadron, the Gang Squad, which is the Oliver 9 and Buki stack, including Aframush and RMN, that is. Left One TV and Singularity. So these are our teams we're looking at. They were seeded into a normal uh, double elimination bracket. Uh, I believe by random, I don't know if there was a drawing or something, I did not follow it that closely. I just know uh, that we had uh, Bounty Hunter against Megalada in the first one, which was already a notable match because I was totally sold on Megalada there, but it turned out <laughs> Bounty Hunter just winning that one 2-1. Uh, in a, well, convincing manner is the wrong word. We had two mediocre games and then a 50-minute thriller with Bloodseekers all over the place. Yuck. Um, yeah, but that brings us to the second series, which is... The one I was really surprised about. Vega Squadron versus Gang Squad. So Vega, notable team, we all know them, had a little bit of a rough time in the, in the TI qualifiers, let's not talk about that. But Gang Squad, we all know these names, but we never seen them play together, that is. Oliver, Nine, Boogie, Aframish, and Armin. That's not something you would have expected, and what we also didn't expect is that they just wiped the floor with Vega, two, uh, one to yeah. two. Like, Vega actually took one game of them. They are uh, Gangsquad won the first one. Vega, after 52 minutes, narrowly won the second one. And then Gangsquad locking down the second game and actually uh, got past them. And that's not even mid. After that, they faced the Bounty Hunter, wiped the floor with them. 2 0 straight off the bat. It was really long games, but both teams did kind of pick for it. Um, yeah. Like, all right, you had your run. Now, on the other side of the bracket, left one TV. They did manage to beat Empire 1 to 2, uh, sending them to the lower bracket. They, uh, they beat Singularity out of the park with 2 0, going up in the finals, looking super strong, and then Gang Squad beat them 2 1. And I actually did cast the last one, that is. Uh, I was cast it by, I believe, Killer Pigeon before uh, on the BTS channels. And the first one was apparently really one sided, but lasted fairly long for left one. The second one was a 26 minute Trian Protector Crystal Maiden Beastmaster draft where gangs would run over them, and they won the third one after 31 minutes with Slark Lashrek. And actually, Gang Squad straight up qualifying for the top group, and we've never seen them before. That was just, it was a bit scary to me. Yes, yeah, who is definitely. this? Why is this working? 
I also feel right. feel bad for like Vega Squadron having Dendi in their lineup for this tournament, and they they couldn't shine out at all. At the I mean, start, I they that. are I would, they yeah, are like, still in. They're still in. They, after... They're definitely in. Let's let's talk about results because they did go down to Gang Squad two one. Yes, that is the that hardest is, but team, hey, so to say. They yeah. they they qualified now, so they're dangerous out of the way. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, looking at the lower bracket, they did beat Ma Megalata in a one a one seventy minute match and a twenty four minute match. At least they balanced it out. Uh, two to zero. Then they did go up against Singularity. Well, 60-minute match, 24-minute match, another bi uh, big thriller. And then now against Nobantia, I couldn't catch the game because we had to do the show. Uh, but they apparently they did want 2-0 and with a dry strat and an Ursa TA. And now they're up against Left One TV, which we, we should watch directly after. I'll send you over there afterwards. But gotta say, I feel like Left One TV might be their master in this tournament, even though I still have high hopes for Vega. Oh, yeah. There's there's one thing that has really caught my eye, especially in this tournament. A friend of mine was talking to me uh, since uh, she she hasn't been playing that much or actually hasn't been watching the, the pro scenes and the lower tier tournaments at all and was asking me, have you seen Crystal Maiden? I said, nope, I haven't. In this tournament, there's quite a lot of CM and... She I know the... I know we talked about the patch last week's in last week's episode, but I really want to talk about Crystal Maiden coming back. Is she, is is she the back? Queen of the safe lane right now. So we have lanes like Crystal Main Luna or something. Anyone that needs mana on the team, pick Sian. Straight up. You don't need mana on the team, doesn't matter, pick her anyways. Like we have people like Lizard talking about it. Uh, and I, I completely agree on his point. Crystal Maiden is going to be the pop hero you're going to face in almost all of your high tier matches from now on. Be prepared for it. Like, you can pick CM in whatever line. It might not straight win you the game due to impact, but it sets your teammates up for victory immediately. It is just so good. You have the strongest AoE nuke in the game on level 1. You have the, one of the best auras for, uh, to sustain yourself. Uh, it's, it's, it's on the same tier as like the Lycanthrope heal, you could say, but it's yeah. with mana. It's fun. Uh, and the second thing, Frostbite is still a thing and works against Mulder's Threat, so the hero is insane. Like, the hero will come back and probably even needs a nerf, I would say, or some slight rebalancing, shifting Mortimer to Frostbite. She doesn't struggle with anything with these strong dual lanes. But I would say enough of Crystal Maiden because we're running short on time and we still have one tournament to talk about. Let's jump straight into that. So the expat.co Rampage series. 12 invited teams, 4 qualified teams, a single elimination bracket, which is always a, a thriller, basically because you're playing these best of three series, and there's no second chance. So you lose a series, you're out. And it does seem to go in a very fast pace. You're casting this tournament, right? So exactly. You, I will let you continue with your All right. With yours. So day one, we had our opening match, uh, Alliance versus Fuse Esports. Uh, I gotta say the first one was pretty straight up Alliance, just run over them. Uh, Second game, I was super surprised because Fuse Esports, absolute no name team. I've never heard of uh, any of their players uh, besides Cole, maybe. Uh, I believe, yeah, Cole being being part of some uh, of elements per gaming at one point. But they they almost took the, like I would say they almost took the series against them. It felt like Alliance was not up for the huge standard there. But second series, Mega Lada versus Gang Squad, huh? Surprise! We we have we have had that before, and Gangs will just straight up wipe the floor with Mega Lada. I gotta say, twenty two minutes and twenty four minutes. That is a quick finish. The, yeah, like really quick finish. It's like you running. That, that's how fast finish that is. Get it? Yep. Come on, and come there, on, that's good. There's <laughs> there's, all, there's right. almost almost an even quicker <laughs> series that followed up right after that one. Yeah, Singularity Backpacks, which is. I gotta say, game two, backpacks tabbing out after 60 minutes, they were tilted. Uh, you could tell they were really disappointed. And especially because two times you run against Undying Winter Wyvern and you lose it with sub 20 minutes, well, 20 yeah. minutes, 26 seconds. It was really frustrating for backpacks to watch. And so you were actually showing me a sh uh, shimmer of hope there. But then comes the open qualifier teams. So we have Ha, or Thinking, which is really hard to pronounce in game, I gotta tell you. Uh, against No Bounty Hunter. Uh, no Bounty Hunter pretty much uh, didn't wipe the floor with them. They had a reasonable chance. But in the end, they just proved to be the better team and just making it forward. 
Uh, we also had Elements Per Gaming against Troublemakers. Troublemakers, I, a team I really had hoped for, but I knew that Elements Per Gaming had actually predicted them as the winner of, this, uh, of the entire tournament. Uh, coming out ahead, they did in the end get a rush through Liberty. Yeah? Um, that were three open qualifier teams out and eliminated. But the fourth one, apparently, which also just completed before, uh, before the show, uh, in two, wow, 63 minutes and 50 minutes uh, uh, in terms of game time, Hunkies from Zavod. I, I'm, I'm sorry if this is offensive in the language. I really don't know what it stands for. Uh, that's their team name, for the record. Uh, did beat Sanguine Sharks, the direct invite. Uh, 2-0. So not a single best of three probably played out yet. Um, I believe there's, yeah, there's basically two matches left, which is Brestemans versus Burden United. And Helsinki Reds versus Left One TV. I wonder who you cheer for now. <laughs> or what, which team you cheer there for. Yeah, I mean, the, the, going backwards a bit, the Hunkies from Savard versus Sanguine Sharks, which is the Unchained Esports lineup, almost entirely except Rujin taking the uh, mid mid role. So area one two three four slash strikes Domainen, Celery, and I believe their mid player was Funkafall. But now Rujin playing in Sanguine Sharks, and they go down zero two against Hunkies from Savard who do have yeah. a... I, I've cast one of their games before. Like, Mariachi and Zako are pretty good players. Oshashash, of course. But I was surprised that they lose this 2-0 because I felt like this series could be the one to go, like, 2-1. All the games have I, been 2-0 so far. Looking at the lineups and... Uh, and yeah, looking, just looking at the lineups, I feel like that was a pretty much a thriller. I uh, couldn't be there, unfortunately. Uh, 63 minutes and 50 minutes like that is not an easy win hunkies took no definitely so that must, that, i would even say like they probably they probably did fight themselves back in uh, in those games that is so yeah looking good right now well oh, wow it was actually actually fairly even up until the 40 minute mark in uh in in both games well, the second one was a little bit better but both things had a good lineup so yeah but that tournament is still ongoing and i believe it continues tomorrow right it does continue tomorrow, every day around 17 CAST. You should definitely go watch because this guy, Potom, he's going to be casting, and That's you me. want to hear that. You want to hear that. Drag and Drop will be accompanying you as well, so I'm probably going to be tuning in as well and take a look. I have my own stuff happening tomorrow, however, I got a very interesting job offer and just want to take a look at how that's going to be going, but not going to be going into <laughs> that. No spoilers. We are, we are almost actually done with uh, today's episode, but Potom, do you have anything you still want to fill in to the end here? Mm, no, I think we're pretty much three. Uh, talked a good bunch about what is upcoming. We're gonna have a little bit. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have a little bit more to talk about once TI actually starts when we get closer to it. And um, the 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 pre TI shuffles will come. Lots of drama incoming. Yeah, there is definitely drama incoming, and we're all looking forward to it. I hope all of you viewers will also look forward to TI and the upcoming BTS Summer Cup, which is ongoing as well, but also the actual summit event, which takes place later on here in July. This is uh, pretty much for it for uh, episode seven of the offlane. I want to thank you viewers for being here, listening to all these topics. If you still have any ideas or feedback, Make sure you also come next week and participate in the conversation about yeah. all of the topics that we have. Us. Same Fee time, Fee. 20 CEST. I want to thank Nursery Gamers for uh, having us. Thank the offlane, the producer, and Potom, most of all you as well. But we are going to be calling this off. So thank you for tuning in and bye bye.